Hello everyone, my name is Alan Jones and I give you a warm welcome to another live story coming to you from live stories worldwide. We bring you stories from across the world, people have had all types of struggles in their lives and how they've overcome those struggles and how their lives have been transformed. You can contact us at any time on our website, lifestoriesworldwide.com. We are live on StreamYard, Zoom, Facebook, YouTube, and also on our website. Probably the easiest way is to watch on our website. Our story today comes from the UK, from Bedford. We have uh, Kelvin Wilmer, who's waiting to share his story. Kelvin was in the Metropolitan Police uh, until in 1975, he joined the army. And, oh, sorry, rather from the army, he joined the Metropolitan Police, get it the right way around, and uh, had many, many things happen to him while he was in the police force. He is now a rector in, in the church in Bedford, and it gave me a great pleasure to introduce Kelvin and ask him to come and share his story. Thank you, Kelvin. Thank you, thank you, Alan. Um, good evening to everybody. Um, well, as you heard, I, I'd, uh, I'd left the army in 1975 and joined the Metropolitan Police, which was uh, a bit of a change, really. And um, I was 20 years old, and where's the best place you can send a 20-year-old man in those days it was to work in the West End of London, which had the Mayfair, which was very posh, and then there was the Den of Iniquity, Soho. And um, Soho had all the sex shows, the live shows, and drug addicts. And we worked there and looked after people, made lots of arrests, dealt with lots of vice. And um, I was quite active as an officer there. Um, I was enjoying myself. And then in 1976, I met my wife. Um, she was also a police officer and um, it was very, very interesting because I was determined never to get married and I met her. We moved in together after three days, got engaged three weeks later and married a year later. Um, and we've now been married 47 years. Um, Jean nominally went to church. So when we got married, we went to her church in East London to get married. And that was as much contact as I'd ever had with a church. Uh, we then moved to our own house out in East London. And eventually we had three children, the oldest one being born in 1981. That was Janet, followed by Fiona, 22 months later. And 22 months after that, we had baby Amy. In 1985, our eldest daughter Janet, at the age of four, contracted leukemia cancer and I was totally devastated I really didn't know how to cope I was a big guy I was on the police riot squads I ran different training units physically very strong and I couldn't protect my daughter and my wife Jean was a young mum and she was going to the young mums club at a local church these people picked us up and drove us backwards and forwards to the hospital where our daughter was receiving treatment at Great Ormond Street. And um, Janet, after six, seven weeks, uh, was the only child that was left alive on that unit that had all started together as one group of children receiving treatment. Uh, she went on to experimental drugs that had come from America. Praise the Lord. Um, because she survived and then um, came home and my wife said we've received a lot of care from these people at this church we ought to go and say thank you and I had no interest in doing that other than to say thank why can't I invite them around for a barbecue and say thank you and Jean said no let's go to the church so we went to the church and I found that there were a few coppers there that I actually worked with um, and they said, well, don't tell anyone that you saw me here. And I thought, well, that's fair enough. Just don't tell anyone you saw me here. Eventually, Jean started going to church and I got to know a few of the people, but I didn't go to church at all. Then we went to a church weekend 
where they had hired the whole of this uh, these um, reserve buildings and we we went there and um, while I was there um, I was quite happy because everyone else was going in for these seminars to learn about God and I was drinking in the bar and then on the Sunday morning we had breakfast all together sitting in this big restaurant and I found myself with two guys that I got to know John and Alan and uh, they started walking with me I thought I was walking out of the restaurant in fact what happened was I walked into the hall where the seminars were being held and I was the first third person in that room and I thought whoa I don't want to be here and I went to turn around to leave but there were 300 plus people walking towards me in the corridor so I couldn't get out so I thought what on earth am I going to do I didn't want to be rude and push my way out and I couldn't just stand at the back because they came in like a swarm and I thought I'll sit down I'll sit down at the end of the aisle about four rows down and I and I sat at the end of the aisle four rows down with the intention that once these people stood up to sing because they I, I did learn that they like to sing a lot of hymns I thought once they stand up to sing I'm going to creep out and then no one would know I was here well what happened was everyone came in and sat down and this guy Hugh Palmer who was giving the lectures jumped on the stage he said we haven't got time to sing he said I'm just going to go straight into it and I thought oh now I could either stand up and just walk out and everyone would look at me or I could crawl along the floor and get out and I thought well I'm not doing that so I just sat there I thought this can't last long and then Hugh Palmer started talking on the book of Romans chapter 8 no condemnation how God loved us through his son Jesus and it all started to like make a bit of sense and then what happened was at the end Hugh Palmer as the lecturer stopped and he said right he said I finished now but let's pray and I thought I want to pray so I just leant forward closed my eyes bearing in mind on the end of the aisle and I just said if you're there I'm here and blow me down this hand came onto my shoulder standing next to me and I opened my eyes and I looked up and there was this very bright light coming from a man standing next to me and all of my anger at my daughter's illness all my anger at life that how unfair it was on my child just disappeared and I knew who this was it was Jesus and he looked at me and he said and this is all he said at that time he said you'll be all right now you'll be all right now honestly I felt so good well as the meeting was breaking up Jesus disappeared and I got up and I walked all the way down this aisle to the stage and I got up on the stage and I broke down in tears and I said to Hugh Palmer I've just met Jesus and I've found God it's all real now Hugh I met afterwards said to me he said when you came down the aisle towards me he said I thought you were going to hit me he said you had such a look on your face he said I was looking for the exit he said I've never been so pleased for a person to tell me that they've turned to Christ as I was when you told me so so after that I then started going to the church and I ended up on the PCCs my daughter still receiving treatment but then they all came to church as well and we joined the prayer meetings and life really did change for the better whereas Jean would go off on a Sunday morning on her own 
I went as well and I met people and learnt so much through through reading the Bible. I'd never read a Bible before in my life. I went on to the church council, which was a real learning curve. Uh, I ended up running youth groups. Honestly, I have no idea how that happened, but I loved it. And then about four or five years later, I was, I was minding my own business and people started saying, have you ever thought of becoming a minister? Or in the Church of England, as we say, a vicar. And I was determined that that wasn't going to happen. I was more likely to quote Monty Python. Life, you know, I was more likely to become a lumberjack than I was to become a vicar. So this went on for a while. I ended up running home Bible groups because I knew that what you believe is real. I tell people I don't have faith because I know it's real. So what you believe, I can assure you, is totally real. So I carried on for a while. And then um, I, I uh, had enough of people telling me, you should be looking at joining the ministry. And I thought, I'll shut them up. I will shut them up. And I will go through this selection process. So I went to see the archdeacon that dealt with the candidates for ordination in Chelmsford. And um, I thought, I was a bit amazed when he actually, after several meetings said, oh no, you, you, you need to go for the selection process. He said, I think you've got what it takes, which is really scary guys, really scary. So I went and I didn't want to do it. And I went to a first selection in 1994, 95, and I blew it, absolutely blew it. The selectors said he really, you know, I was basically there just, just for the weekend and I hadn't shown any interest in what was going on because I didn't want to do it. I tried to prove to myself that I was right and everyone else was wrong. So I got home, got told uh, two weeks later that I hadn't been selected. And I thought, eh, what does God know? And then I had a vision of God standing there with his arms folded, looking at me like I was a, re a naughty child. And I really did feel embarrassed. And the director of ordinance, the archdeacon, he phoned me up. He said, no, he said, I'm sending you for this again. He said, they've got it wrong. He said, I don't really do this very often. So they sent me again. So in 1998, I was uh, selected for ordination training and I, and I did a part-time course um, because I was still working as a policeman. But as I started that course, my oldest daughter, Janet, got cancer again. She was 17 years old and the leukemia had come back. Oh, was I angry, but I wasn't angry with God. And he said, in, when I prayed to him, should be okay. Notwithstanding the fact that I knew Jesus was real and that I'd been to Romania after the revolution and I'd worked out there in the orphanages with a, a, a charity and uh, I only went because Jesus told me I had to go. But coming back um, was when I, I actually knew that uh, I should be doing more for him. So becoming a priest in, in 2001, when I was ordained, um, I then ended up as the police chaplain for the officers on the Isle of Dogs in East London, which is where Canary Wharf is, for those of you that know it. And um, it was just as the 9-11 attack took place in New York. So I became the chaplain. I spoke to lots and lots of people about their fears. In fact, I was the multi-faith chaplain. We had a lot of guys who were in the territorial army. So they were called up for service when we went to war. And they came back after their tours in the Helmand province. And uh, they were suffering PTSD. I spent a lot of time with them, chatting away to them, just to get them to talk about their experience. 
and then some of them I managed to refer for further mental health uh, support. And then I ended up retiring from the police in 2005. And um, that's when life got interesting. I, I'd actually gone for a job to become a security manager at a local airport at Stansted, and I got the job. But the Bishop of East London, the Bishop of Barking, asked to see me. So I went to his office and he said, it's 2005, he said, I don't know if you're aware, he said, but we've got the Olympics coming to London for 2012. And I'd like you to consider being the chaplain for the Olympic construction workforce. So I thought it must be easier to be a vicar than it is to be a full-time vicar than it is to be um, head of security at uh, an airport. So I took the role of uh, chaplain at the Lon at, uh, London Olympic Construction Workforce. And I ended up becoming the chaplain for 23,000 men and women in that place. I mean, it started out in East London as a mud flat and the Olympics that you saw, if you saw it at all, um, I had access to every part of that and spoke to most of the people that were on that site. One or two of them uh, went off and started going to church. I thought, goodness me, what have I done? And the Lord was pleased with me. My daughter had been cured and then told that she couldn't have children. So she got married. And her husband was aware of that, that she couldn't have children. And then after being married for four years, they had children in answer to our prayers. So the Lord had blessed us very well. And I carried on working at the Olympic Park until 2012. And then from there, just ended up um, going to work in a village and then coming up here to Bedford in 2017. Um, I've worked in Europe as a priest and I've had lots of conversations with non-Christians, non-church going people, uh, people that are having crisis of faith. And the one thing that I've been able to do through the blessing of God, through meeting Jesus, is to assure them that it's all real. It's all true. And it's been one of the biggest privileges that I've ever had. I've done lots of things, um, running churches and changing styles of worship, but basically the whole thing is to worship the Lord. And that's been my mantra. And I've just noticed I've got my police helmet and hat in the background there. Um, so that doesn't prove I was a policeman. I don't know what will. The uh, the other thing about being um, a priest is you get to be part of people's lives. And just recently we've had, uh, we've had a guy that's uh, an ex-serviceman and he's been living on the streets. So two years ago, he just wandered into the church, sat down, found out we had something in common. And um, he said, so what's this God thing all about? So we managed to get him somewhere to live through uh, a charity and he came back and started talking about God and he came into the church and last year I baptized him and he was confirmed into uh, the church and he is one of the strongest advocates that we've got for for God's ministry it's um, those kind of things that make me realize that we can all have a role. All of us listening, we are ministers in our own way because Jesus did call us all to you know, minister to his flock, to go out and make disciples of all men and women. Uh, we have a, we have a obligation to fulfill that. So that's in, in 20 minutes, really, that's basically my story. So I don't know if uh, George is going to come in and ask any questions, 
but uh, that'd be a good yeah. time. George is going to come with some questions in a moment, but first right. of all, oh, thank you, Kelvin, you're sharing. Oh, there's a lot more you're share. A lot more you will probably share with George. But uh, you've had uh, lots of experiences, uh, wonderful experiences in your life. But how God has brought you through and has blessed your family as well. Yeah, it's been wonderful to hear that. And the people listening today and watching today and wondering, is God real? And you should. Yes, He is. You actually yeah. met Jesus. You know He's alive. He's risen from the dead, and He wants a relationship with every one of you. He wants you to know Him in a personal <coughs> way. He wants you to to have a relationship, a wonderful relationship with Him. And how can you have that relationship? Well, the Bible says that we've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, not one. There's not one person who is good enough, really, to, to go to heaven. But Jesus came and died on a cross in your place. He took the punishment for your sins and poured out his blood to wash your sins away. And all you have to do is repent of your sin. That means turn away from your old life. Really make that conscious decision. You're going to have a, a, begin a new life. And then invite him to come into your heart and life. And he's waiting to come in. He, he won't force himself into your life. But if you will invite him, he will come. And your life will be completely transformed. You will receive the free gift of eternal life.